that opening sentence was one that you and I have said in different ways many times. That truth cannot be grasped in abstract principles. That is impossible to grasp truth solely through abstract principles. Therefore, we need a demonstration to secure that truth within our own minds and hearts. And Paul knew that's what the, Ro- the believers at Rome needed. And so after getting into justification by faith, we say the first three chapters are just the first part of the letter. He brings forth that great model of faith, our father, the father of all of our faith, Abraham, And he reminds them of that demonstration that had been made centuries before when no Bible had been written. And I pointed out from Romans 4 and the last verses in Romans 4 that Abraham's faith was our model because it was personal, because it was realistic, Because it was conquering and because it was a tested faith. Personal. The verse was, if you remember, I went right down almost successfully or successively in the verses. The verse was 17, 417. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him, whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. So Abraham's faith was personal. That's important because that's the substance of faith. Codes and creeds and philosophies can be maintained without personality. In fact, Some of the great world religions do not have as their center a personality and none of them a living God, a living Christ. See, the founder of our faith is resurrected and living. And so we we grasp truth from his life. That's the greatest demonstration. But in order to get people to believe in him, we point toward another even as Paul did. He pointed toward Abraham. Because Abraham had neither um, the Red Sea or Calvary or Genesis to Revelation. And yet he had everything. The latter part of the message, I said something that I think could be profound. That was that we have all of this and unless we have the voice, we have less than Abraham had. See, that's the essence of faith, is the inner living Christ. We've talked about it, but the reality of it is quite different. And Paul is is really earnest in writing the Romans, and he's paying a terrible price to get across something that everybody ought to be jumping up and down about. That, that, That God, he said, this mystery's been hidden for hundreds of years, but now it's been revealed. Christ in me, the hope of glory. That that God, a living person, would come down as a baby. That's what he did. Went to Calvary, went away, but through the Holy Spirit, he came came back and he came to live right there. Not not in a cubby hole in the temple, but in this human heart and in this human heart, And in this human heart, that touches my heart, (laughs) this human heart, in this human heart, this human heart, and this one right here, and this one right here. For some reason, when I got to Larry, it operated in my heart. If you had any doubt about God living in his heart, you ought to be be encouraged now. (laughs) Because the God that lives in mine spoke to me about him living in his That's great. 
It's a personal. Faith is personal. I'm going to say something at the end of this that, that could be profound also. I think rather it is because he spoke to me about it on the way up here. It's, it can't be in circumcision and in the law because the law came 450 to 430 years later and circumcision came 14 years later. You say, well, I know that. Well, wait just a minute. You and I have rested so much on our religious observance. What's the equivalent of that? Well, baptism today, or if not that, simply coming to church regularly, keeping code, having a philosophy, writing a book called "What the Bible," uh, uh, what what the Bible teaches, and 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 saying you got to live up to this, and putting all men to a test over that. Whatever your background is, you can make the application. No, that isn't it. Whatever's right or whatever's wrong in that book, and of course in this book it's not wrong, but even this, even, even reading this and trying to obey this is not the, is not the sum and substance of uh, Christianity. It is faith, a belief in, and an entirely trust of and a submission to the Lordship of Christ. But it's personal. And it's kept up like a love relationship. And we walk with him and we talk with him. And that's what Abraham did. Now this explains it and this gives us balance and structure. But it is not the substance of our religion. The substance is in, in, is in its immediacy. It's in, in our direct contact with God. The amazing thing is that evangelical Christianity really does not believe what I'm telling you. Because when you talk about the direct voice, you're in trouble with evangelical Christianity today. You're in trouble with them. They've got it right here. Here's the God, and when this becomes the God, this becomes bibliolatry. He, this is not him. It's an extension of him, and not even alive unless the Holy Spirit lives within the heart. Otherwise, you get into bibliolatry. That's what they did with the law. Most of that law is written in the earlier part of this book. And yet this is what most all of evangelical, Christ, evangelical Christianity believes, and this is nearly all of what you hear on radio and TV today. I, I'm not ready to dig my grave, so I won't press that too far, but that's, pre, that's pretty profound right there. Rodney says pretty exciting, because that's what he found by God's grace. Secondly, his faith, this is by way of review, his faith was realistic, I use the new, new, uh, uh, new International Version because it brought it out so well. The 19th verse was where I drew the second point from. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. I said that Abraham was realistic. He didn't evade or ignore the fact that his body was dead. That is, there was no seed no, he had no power to reproduce, nor did Sarah have the power to conceive. And what did he do? He, it, it wasn't a blindness to the facts. And when your faith is like that, it's not a true faith. Faith is recognizing the facts. If you don't do that, you're into idealism. Now, idealism doesn't have enough power to take you through. Faith is a recognition of the facts. But that's only half of realism. This is Sunday's message. The other half is to, is to see all of reality. There's a dead body, but there's an all-powerful God who recreated that body and cannot do one of two things. He can either recreate or give miracle, and it's both miracle. When you think it's both miracle. If you recreate a man's reproductive system, I don't know what he did. I guess Isaac was a miracle. 
I don't know whether he recreated his reproductive system or whether I, I don't remember my studies. Do you? What? Then he then he had to repre, he had to recreate his reproductive. He got him alive. He he made his body come alive. That that's a miracle. When a grandpa starts his family all over again and brings forth the child of promise. Boy, the Lord brought romance back into his life, didn't he? Really quickened his body and that of Sarah's. And that's great. He kept Moses active and without, uh, see, I think his eyesight was not dimmed and his natural powers were unabated at 120 years of age. And I'll tell you that's something. That's great. Moses was a powerful person, powerful man. But facing the facts is what we're supposed to do, but we're we're supposed to look at all of reality and we don't, when something's dead and something's a blockage, we don't keep our eyes on that. We simply recognize it, but we look to God for a miracle. And that's, that's really the essence of our salvation. That's, that's, that's the story of the valley of the dry bones of which Israel has illustrated in her nationhood at this time. She's alive again in nationhood, but my friends, there's a better day coming for Israel when she really becomes alive in the spirit. Then the, then the dry bones, will that body that comes together and has skin and, and will have spirit within the Holy Spirit of God. And when that comes, when her Messiah is recognized and appreciated, um, it'll be a day of miracle. And uh, that day most men thought would never come but it, it's, it's coming. It's nearly here. I gave you two examples of, uh, of uh, miracle. I, I felt, I felt like in as much as he had helped us with the building fund campaign, and now we were over halfway through, and we were not scheduled to borrow $740,000 dollars. We, we knew that we'd be strained to borrow half a million or not more than 600,000 and to have to borrow 740,000. But God has pulled us over the hump and, uh, and under looking to our spiritual leader, elder purchased another piece of property when, it, when we shouldn't have purchased it at all, realistically speaking. But God helped us to do that. And then because of uh, help, in keeping our financial package together, uh, we were able to purchase the property and there's nothing against it and only borrow 13500 from the Bank of St. Albans. Now, we, if, if you know all the... You don't even need to know all the details. You just know that's a lot of money. So that's a million dollars plus all involved. And, and the, the Holy Spirit said at the very beginning, I will, I will take you through. I will help you. You, I will work with your people to pay for this. It, it just looked like we couldn't do it, but we did. The other example I gave you was when Mark was, came forth, was conceived and was a baby. And Jeannie said to me, not knowing what she was saying, really, I don't think she knew. I, I'm sure she didn't. I would like to have my son a bar mitzvah service for my son. And I simply said, not, not knowing of the impossibilities, uh, that's in my heart. Your son will have such a service. <laughs> not only did he have a service, he had a rabbi as well as a Christian preacher, and he had his service at the Western Wall, which when she spoke that hadn't been liberated long with the blessings of the Orthodox rabbi. See, it's, it's greater. Something's happening in our midst that's quite great. You, 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 can't hardly, you can't hardly get the Jewish lads over this world of that wall for a service, much less a Gentile. We made it. And they weren't sure whether we would be run off. We were, we're not only, we're not run off, we were blessed. <laughs> See, that, I know that's a miracle. But, but the realism is in hearing the voice and listening to the voice, not looking at the impossibility, the voice of God. He controls everything. I'm, I'm thrilled when I think about it. Thirdly, Abraham had a conquering faith. 
the New English Bible or the National uh, New International says, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened. He, he not only um, didn't weaken, he got stronger. And uh, that my third point Sunday morning was that it was a conquering faith and that we are to grow stronger instead of weaker because we keep our eyes upon the promise rather than on the problem and our faith should grow in spite of difficulties. That, uh, we've said that before, but it, it, seems, it seems fuller. It seems greater. It seems more wonderful to me than it did when we've talked about it before. It, it just, it's true. When I look at Abraham here, and his personal faith, his realistic faith, his conquering faith, and realize he had no Bible, no parting of the Red Sea, no Calvary, no prophets and no apostles. He didn't have anything like we have that are faith builders, that are p- to push us to this relationship to God. He didn't have it. How did he get, how'd he get that stronger faith? How in the world did he do that? I'll tell you how he got it. He got acquainted with the one that spoke. And in getting acquainted with the one that spoke, he became what few people have ever become. He became a friend of God. He loved God. That means he didn't criticize his neighbor. Because criticism is a form of hate. And, it's, and criticism is uh, first cousin to murder. I want you to know that when I was in my office here, that not one of you ever went out in and out for counseling or anything or ever call me on the phone, not once by God's grace did I ever say, I'd rather they, I would rather that I not see them or rather they not. Now, if I felt my inability, that's another, that's another question. I felt that way many times. But as far as loving you, you never had, I, I never was on a downer when you went out. That is, I didn't put you down. How could you ever have confidence in me if I put you down? How could you ever have confidence in me if I talk to you on the phone and I put up the phone and I says, well, I wonder who they think they are. What if I ever had a thought like that? Boy, if I did, I'd have to erase it right now because my integrity, I can't live with myself on the inside if I have such a thought. Not in my relationships with any person. I can't think that. Nor should you. When he got acquainted with God, he couldn't be upset with Lot, and he couldn't act toward those who imposed upon him. He couldn't have any bad thoughts. He couldn't have it. Why? Because he was acquainted with him who didn't have bad thoughts toward people. And getting acquainted with him, he became a living Bible. That's how he got strong faith. He, he, he got acquainted with, with him who created heaven and earth. He got acquainted with Jesus. And getting, and getting acquainted with him, he didn't even need this. That's strong, but that's the truth. I know he didn't need it because if he needed it, God had give it to, given it to him. Say, so how would he give it to him? Well, the Lord knows what's going to be written. He let him see Jesus. He could have just brought it in. Uh, just let him read it. So now this is going to be written a few centuries later, and you need this, but he, he didn't have that. See, it's, it's tremendous. When I think of his relationship with God, and did you, you see? You see, that can be for each one of us. But we have faith builders all through here and tremendous examples, all of this going for us. And yet, most all of us have less faith than Abraham had. There's no reason for it. There's no reason for it. If we love him and we acquaint ourselves with him, our faith should be that of Abraham's or stronger. Abraham was a man just like you, just like me, just like Jim White, like Oliver Hogue. That's That's the kind of man Abraham was. How did he get like that? He allowed himself, denied himself, and allowed himself to become acquainted with the creator of heaven and earth. And and he got rid of all things idolatrous. And the Lord still let him be a rich man. Didn't stand in his way. See, he trusted him with quite a bit. 
and it didn't get in his way. It does in most of ours, but not him. It's a tremendous thing. I rejoice over it by God's grace. Then I've concluded with the fact that he had a, that he had a tested faith. And um, I don't remember what I said about it. But that was my final point, and I used that in the, in the last scripture. What I want to finish with is, um, oh, I did say this, if you remember. I said that we, we don't need to go around encouraging each other to, to, to exercise more faith. I said, that's wrong. I said, the smallest grain, now I'm speaking in another vein now. A while ago I was making some comparisons, but this is another vein here. I said, of the faith of a grain of mustard seed will, will put Mount Hermon into the sea. Jesus said so. So don't go around intimidating people and tell them the reason they're not healed is because they don't have enough faith. A faith, if it's pure, can be as a small, comparably as a grain of mustard seed and bring the healing to pass. Now, of course, purity is the Purity is the point. <laughs> well, there's a lot of things that get within us that, that, that dilute purity. But purity will do it. Just pure enough, the size of a grain of mustard seed. And Mount Hermon can run right into the Mediterranean. Or he can carry it over to the Pacific. And that's a long way. For anything, at, as touching anything on earth, he said it shall be given you. Well, you wouldn't ask for anything wrong. Pray and find the will of God. You see, that's what Brother Helm's wanting. By the way, that word in Aramaic, I'm told, agree, is the word for melted or welded together. Pure. Pure bonding. See, when two of you get together like that, of course, the word in Greek is symphony. It means harmony. You know that. But I remember now that the uh, Hebrew word is the word for, uh, for perfect purity in being melted together, welded together. Yeah, I didn't know if you knew, you didn't know that, did you? But I remember it now. Someone told me that some time ago. So, now, in writing the Roman church, here's what, I, what little I wanted to add to the sharing tonight. Paul didn't give himself as an example, I don't think, I remember the entire 16 chapters because the Roman church as a whole did not know him. But after he got to Rome, he wrote the church at Philippi and said to them, as he had written earlier in the letter of Thessalonica and then in his final prison experience, he wrote Timothy in so many words, I am an example of faith. what he meant when he said, follow me as I follow Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. I, you see, like Abraham, he'd stripped himself of everything that was not relevant. Everything. I count all things as loss. All ritual, all uh, right, all uh, philosophy, all uh, prestige, everything that meant something in religion, not only stripped himself of it, he counted it a certain way. as garbage, as one translation says, the King James says is dung. Abraham did that. Paul did it also. So Paul is, is a better example to the church in that day at, at Abraham and Paul saw it, saw it. He may have seen it, in, uh, well, he saw it early because he wrote in the, the Thessalonica letters, which were written before Caesarea and before his imprisonment. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. So, so he's saying, he said, I am a living demonstration of faith. And if you want to know what faith's like, if you want to know about this faith relationship and how much more vital it is than religious observance, he said, watch me, look at me. Boy, they had the example. They really had it. And they saw what organized religion did to him. 
It's all how organized religion. And see, Peter didn't say that. Oh, it's in my heart. Peter didn't say that. Why didn't he say that? Because you can see why. Because the other 12 apostles were still somewhat clinging to the old forms, but not Paul. He saw that it wasn't necessary. I'm coming to something that Jesus spoke to me about coming here. I trust there'll, I trust there'll not be any swine in the place and that you will, when I share this, that you will not tread upon this pearl. In Rome, he could not, in writing to the Romans, he could not say, follow me as I follow Christ, because as a whole, they didn't know him, though certain persons there did. So he cites Abraham. Only once did he write, follow God directly. And that was in the queen of the epistles, in Ephesians, in a high, beautiful moment, the perfect, the perfect, the perfect challenge is given. And that is to follow God directly. And because when we have the inner voice, that's possible. Boy, but I tell you, in between, between the time we get the inner voice and the time we come to maturity, whenever that is, most of us need an example. And here's where evangelical Christianity is just about lost her, her mind. She debunked the Pope and made everybody a little Pope. As, as if we were all perfect vicars of Christ. There were no such thing. Just like little children need a mother and daddy, we need shepherds. We need models. That's why Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. And only once did he say, follow God. He did that in the, in the Ephesians letter when he was up, that high queenly epistle. He spoke like that. He spoke suddenly because that's the perfect. That's what the apostles do. And that's what it is possible for us to do. If we get the vision that Paul had, if we get the vision that God's given Brother Ham, we won't have to follow any man. But most of us need to follow some man but only that, that man that's following Jesus. And it's like children and learning from their parents. It's not that they aren't persons in their own right, and it's not that they're, but the, the whole idea is to equip them. That's why the apostles and the prophets and the pastors, and teach, to equip them so they can be like him and they can get their orders directly. Isn't it wonderful that he speaks to us? once in a while anyway. He does. But now friends, to, to have this voice, to have this leading is to have the power of the universe. He can't, it's, perf, it's perfectly reasonable why he can't, why he can't trust us with, with the full measure of his voice and the leading at every moment because the slightest bit of carnality is going to, that's the reason young men are in trouble with the gifts. And yet God's patient and he works with them though they're wrong and they get the answer of flesh sometimes. The gifts are still operating. How, but they, they need a spiritual leader. They need someone to hold them in check. And of course, we can't be grumpy about it. God loves these men and women enough to put the inner voice within them. And loves you enough to put the inner voice to speak within the heart. I don't know. I've looked down at Brother Mike here while I'm preaching and he'll, he'll grab his heart even tonight. And he's one of the newest converts in our midst right over here. Here's a little babe in Christ that God speaks to. Why does, why does he do that? <laughs> well, that's his business. But it helps me. Ron, over here, I'll check you over here and I'll see him have the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. And he, I can tell many times when God's confirming what I'm saying, Raymond may be way back there, I can tell it. Some of you are quiet, you don't tell me, but he's speaking to you, letting me know. That's so wonderful. That's so encouraging. Now, here's what he spoke to me about. And this is a real treasure. You may not recognize it as such, but after a while, if you suffer, you will appreciate what I'm about to say. Note the absence of ritual and tradition in the leadership of the Holy Spirit under Brother Helm's ministry. Note the absence. 
Note the absence. It's only been led to wash feet one time. And to have communion, maybe a time or two or three in his entire ministry. Uh oh. Uh oh. And here's what the, here's, oh, he speaks to me. This is what he told me. He touches my heart now. All right. In the absence of faith, you need ritual and tradition to hold things together. But not if you have his voice. And that touches your heart. And that touches your heart. And that's where it touched my heart. And I broke. Barbara heard me break. She doesn't know, she didn't know till now what I, it made me cry. I said, oh God, oh Lord. See, when I got there, the reason we have to have, let me tell you something and I, here's what I was excited about. His voice is so much better than ritual. I love good, inspired, responsive reading. I love it, but there's something better than that. And it's his voice. It's the voice of God, the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. It's God's voice himself. Christianity has to have it because they don't have his voice. And we evangelicals pride ourselves because we don't have ritual and our services are uglier than high church services. Because it isn't his voice, it is not near as pretty. And we get up and direct our singing and have our same old sing song pattern, so on and so forth, and think we've got it over the Catholics? We're foolish. Think we've got it over the Lutherans? Nah, we've got it better than what we've got. And we get up and give tradition and ritual and observance. Now you think, now I wanted to talk to you. Did you see why, how, how come I was excited? I said, oh Lord, I understand him better now. Now I see what Paul saw. Now I see why he threw it all away. Wasn't needed, he had the voice. He had what Abraham had. I mean, the, the, the mechanics of the process. Not the word of God, which was his treasure. He proved himself by that word. But, but do you see? was no longer ritual and observance, right? Circumcision didn't matter anymore. And I just read an article uh, in, a, in a Jewish magazine this week and boy, some Jewish feminist was letting them have it. And I kind of had to appreciate what she said because she said, now listen. It's God ordained circumcision, but it's over. If you're going to have a universal uh, rule, it's got to apply to female and male. And boy, she's letting them have it. I said, oh God, I'm thankful I'm a Christian. Because it's not in circumcision. At least the right, and I'm not putting down Judaism. Uh, we know what it did and what it was for, and we know that God's working now. It's in his hands and our dear friends. But I'm talking to you Christians. The uh, Really, if we're really, truly Christian, the feminists can't point their finger at us. Because in Christ, there is no male nor female. Furthermore, the rights and the observances are universal. Like what's good for the male is good for the female. Oh, it's good. I'm so happy about it. Besides that, the voice belongs to all. The voice of Jesus belongs to all. And whenever we don't keep our relationship of faith with him, we'll have more ritual and more observance. I've tried to make you appreciate high church, but he doesn't lead for it very regularly. I'm so excited about that. And see, I cried. I cried. I said, oh, she heard me. Barbara heard me cry. I said, oh, because when I said in the absence of his voice, we need ritual and, and, and right and uh, philosophy. We need all of this to hold us together in the hope that his voice can come back. 
And boy, while I was in that revelation, he spoke to me right out of heaven. And, and then I understood Brother Helm better. I said, oh, no wonder. See, even to try to doctor up a service and tell, well, we didn't doctor this one up. Now, there's a little structure here because I'm not Paul and I'm not Brother Ham. When I say structure, God's helped us. Look how marvelous. You know what? Well, who across this nation <laughs> would have a music committee pray over them? What spiritual leader hardly would have a music committee pray in there and, and, and take a look at those songs and say, now, we're, uh, uh, try to fit them into it. And he studied at home. He doesn't know what the songs are going to be. And he comes to the service. <laughs> what? It's so wonderful. <laughs> you try to tell somebody about it. Unless you're talking to James Newby or somebody that knows something about the Quaker, about God working through the Quakers 300 years ago, they'll think you, they think you're about half nuts. But now my friends, wait a minute. We're psychologically sound by God's grace. There's nothing nutty going on here. We're just following the voice. See, he said, Brother Helm said in the last waiting, he said that, it, he says, every, God has a plan for every service. And he wants us to find that plan. Oh, great. I've had such a great time. David, it's been so wonderful. David's about to fall over. He's one of the greatest amongst us, one of the most humble, but he's about to fall over because he's got the most, he's the most educated. He's got to die the most. He's the man that has to scrape himself off the wall about every service because <laughs> there's so much education back there. And he remembers, but what delights him is that he sees, the, he sees what God's telling us. God works it in his heart and he knows to follow Jesus is the best. Oh, how beautiful it was tonight. I looked at these songs talking about Jesus being near us and I thought of what I was going to say. I said, Lord, you're the only one that could have known. And coming, just think, he said to me something I've, I, I, he helped me to understand on the way to service tonight and I wanted everybody to be here. You know what, it's a good crowd. I, I'm thankful. But after the choir sang, I thought, oh, no wonder, Lord. No wonder you wanted everybody to be here. In the absence of the voice of God, in, 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 now this is it. In the absence of faith, we have to have these things. To hold the religious people together. Oh, I'm excited. My, my friends, this faith, in opera, this faith involves talking to the living God. This faith involves a submission to him and him speaking to the inner heart. And, 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 since, and since Calvary, since his death, since the veil was rent in twain, it's been open to every man. All may have it if they will not grow up. If they'll get saved and become as a little child, they may have the inner voice. The living God who comes into the heart at conversion will stay in there and then he will manifest himself as we're sanctified, as he can trust us. It's, it's great. Oh, Terry, oh, Terry. We've been together all these years and tonight on my way to church, sitting over the side, feeling as if I were almost a bruised reed and hoping I wouldn't break, God speaks to me on the way. And, and things fall in place more than they ever have. And I understand Brother Helm better. I said, oh, he's like Paul. No wonder, God bless him. No wonder they think he's sod. But he's, he's just following the voice of God. Now, don't remember, we may have misunderstood him a time or two. That's our thousands of leadings or as a human being, he may have missed it. But remember what he said. He said, I'm only in the beginning. And I'm just beginning to hear that in the last year. He said, I'm at the fringe of the alpha. So why should we expect him to be like God himself when he's just a human being and just trying to get started? I heard him say it, but it's never, it's never dawned on me that he really meant it. 
Not that I doubted him. I just didn't, I just didn't appreciate what he said. I said, oh my goodness, he's, he's in the beginning. He means what he's saying. He's just trying to get into kindergarten. And if he's in the kindergarten, he doesn't know it. But like 2,000 years ago, I think we ought to be like Timothy. I think we ought to stay with him. I think we ought to let him get a good start or help him get a good start. <laughs> now, what I preach tonight is one of the most revolutionary. It's one of the most, it's one of the greatest things I could have ever shared. And, 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 and its perspective was given to me because he spoke to me in the inner voice. He told me, he illuminated my mind and he operated in my heart and, and, and I wept because I understood one man better and I understood the Apostle Paul better and I understood Abraham better and had greater hope for myself. Well, and then I wrote the final word, Brother Ham is the greatest model I know of today. He says, greatest model I know of today. And you and I are the most privileged people I know of today. That's not saying we're anything. We really aren't. The sooner we know it, the sooner we hear the voice. Because the voice is only entrusted to nothings. Those that know themselves to be nothing. The more clearly we find that out, the more he can trust us because nothing thinks itself to be nothing and therefore doesn't foster its opinions and philosophies off on someone else. But trust God. It loves God with all of its heart, soul, mind, and strength and loves, it, loves its neighbor as itself. And is very careful with all things. Isn't that wonderful? And nothing never complains. If I've spoken to you on a telephone and I've finished I don't hang up and complain. Don't think bad thoughts about you. I love you. And you must know that I love you. As weak and awful as I am, you, and as sinful as I am, but God has cleansed all of those. Tonight, I, I, I sung that song with you, Be Near, and it said, take all my sin away or whatever it was. They're all gone. At least I'm up to date in freshness by God's grace. But, but I must love you. I must love you the same. And I know that I, I can't, I'm not a model of perfection, but I, I, I do follow a model of a perfect heart. And I know that God can place a perfect heart within me. At least I have knowledge enough to know where to deny myself. So I must be kind to all persons that I'm in relationship with and I must love and I must be awakened to love and I must be reminded of love and I must be prodded to love and I must respond to love and I must learn how to love. And how can you argue with just getting started? And if I'm off balance, but honest of heart, the Holy Spirit will put balance in me. See, it's great. And Jesus is not mad at anybody. Jesus is thrilled with everybody. He's trying just drill with you all. And he entrusts us with an awful lot when you think about it. So beautiful and so precious. So we understand something tonight. And this came out of Sunday's sermon. Abraham, father of our faith. And tonight in perspective, I reviewed that, but I kept feeling pressed to put it all aside. So I put it all aside and just looked up at him. And suddenly he told me, he illuminated my mind and he told me, he says, this, this, this is why ritual and right are needed. And, I, and it operated in my heart and just broke me. But he said, where I'm leading it is not needed unless I call for it. If I call for the Apostles' Creed or I call for whatever, then that's, then that's what's needed for the hour. Wasn't well, that great? David, Rodney, what are you fellows going to say? What are you going to talk about? What, or are you going to talk about this tomorrow at the office? Are you going to review this with the, you, you're going to go over this by God's grace? Did you ever hear anything like it in your life? 
Neither have I. Is there any response you want to make? Yes. All right. I was hoping you would ask. <laughs> I really was. I, uh, I'm very moved. Uh, more moved than even Sunday. And, and I was very moved Sunday by your message, Pastor. I praise the Lord. Um, what moves me is the message. But what moves me more than that is the messenger. And uh, we are so grateful for Brother Helm. And uh, who, can, who can speak enough about his life? And, and certainly pastors pointed it out to us. Uh, there's nobody like him. And, and we are a privileged people to be uh, a part of his ministry. But what I want to thank God for is that in almost eight years that I have seen a man here in this pulpit that has a personal walk with God. His faith is very realistic. He faces the facts, but he sees the whole panoramic view. Jesus. And it's been a conquering faith, folks, against great obstacles daily that many of us don't know anything about, but God has helped him. It's a tested faith. And uh, it's a faith that, that, that everything, by God's grace, he's sharing, he's living. And oh, it means so much. It, it really touches me when I say that. Oh, Heavenly Father, sanctify It means so pray. much. I, I know this is hard on him yes. when somebody does that. It really is. And he might rather we not do it, but yes. I've got to be thankful. I've I'm, got to be grateful. I'm thankful to Jesus. I'm grateful for our Lord's help. Uh, I will tell you this, Pastor, that when I was devastated Sunday, when I finally began to pull out of it, I said, in, in the Holy Spirit operate, I said, well, Jesus, it was good for me. I said, I'm wanting, I'm wanting to get on a cross. I, I know I can't. I, I, people just don't voluntarily climb on one. And, uh, but we can't deny ourselves. Yes, but I guess the way to take it up is when we deny ourselves because there's the obedience and it involves a cross. And, but he, he operated. I was telling one of the men of God, I said, you know, I was just devastated. I said, that spirit was stronger than I was. I mean, I said, it just nailed me. But I said, it was good for me. It's good for me because I want to be sanctified. And I said, they may have meant it for evil, carnal nature. May have come at me with everything, but it didn't do anything but good for me. Because it just seems like to me there's not much left. But God knows how much left. And he, he just, I just got nailed. And it took me two or three days to have courage to come back because I'm a weak person. But, but I'm thankful. I'm excited. I'm so thankful. I'm so grateful that you're excited. What and we get here, Pastor, is, uh, is so feeding uh, in one service. Uh, and I don't want to be redundant, but I, I want to thank God. What we get here in one service is, is so far beyond uh, what I've experienced in majority of places, you know. I know God is at work in other places, but I'm trying oh, yes. to be happy that somehow He got me and you to a place where He's working. That's what I'm trying to be thankful for. He's working here. Yes, sir. He's feeding us. And, yes, sir. And, uh, and it could be that in these testing times that, that He's trusting us with a little meat. That's right. He's trusting us with some meat. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm thrilled with what God's doing here. And how he's helping you to preach to us. Yes. Because uh, uh, I've heard people preach these scriptures and uh, nothing's ever come out of it like that. Yeah. So I want to thank God for your life. Praise and thank God for how he's helping Praise you to the preach. Lord, Pastor. Praise the Lord. I want to say about this now. Not the mosaic economy that's prescribed. But in as much as this is the word of God, it's eternal. Mm -hmm. So it's never outdated. And the only way it could be bibliolatry if it's, if it's held in letter, because he said that kills. If it's held in letter to be the living word, it's the living word when the Holy Spirit anoints it afresh. Otherwise, it kills and cuts. Paul said that. So I want you to know you can't, this is not like ritual. You can't do away with this because this is the, this is the, this is the revealed will of God and it lasts forever. It's enduring. It's general. But the specific will of God is revealed by his voice. 
He said, like he talked to me on the way tonight. Or he said, go to England, November the 8th through the 17th. Can't find that Genesis to Revelation. But it's in harmony with what's here. And what's here is, blessed are the hungry, for they shall be filled. Isn't that great? See, I wanted to say it in case anyone thought that I, well, no, you know, no, this is right here. That's what I preached out of Sunday. That's what I preached out of tonight. The whole structure is right there because the word of God endures forever. It'll be forever and ever and ever. So we got to have this. We got to hide this in our heart. But it, it, uh, his voice is what brings this to life. What makes this apply. What puts this within the heart. Otherwise, it a, it's a, becomes a dead letter and it kills. So I wanted to explain that. And I thought that would be helpful also because we have many backgrounds here by God's grace.